We welcome you to the program, the title of the sermon, The Parable of the Leaven, Matthew 13 and 33. I invite you to turn to that page. We'll be looking at the verse in just a moment. What is the setting of the parable? In Matthew 13, 1 to 2, we see how Jesus sat by the Sea of Galilee. Matthew 13, 1 and 2, Matthew records, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. Jesus spoke many things to the multitude that stood on the shore. He spoke to them in parables, Matthew 13 and 3. Some have described parables as earthly stories with heavenly meanings. Today, we're going to look at one of those parables. The parables of Jesus spoke included the sower, the tares, the mustard seed, and the leaven in Matthew 13. Of the parables, Jesus spoke that day by the sea, that busy day. He only explained the first two, the parable of the sower and the parable of the tares. Today, we will look at the parable of the leaven. Matthew 13, 33, another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid and three measures of meal, till it was all leavened. Looking at this parable a portion at a time, Jesus began by saying the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. He did not say the kingdom of heaven is leaven. He said that the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. And so he makes a comparison between leaven and the kingdom of heaven. They understood leaven. In Jesus' parable, we see Luke and Matthew write. In Luke's account, Jesus called the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of God in Luke 13 and 30. On that occasion, sometime later, Jesus said the kingdom, it is like leaven. Luke 13, 21. He taught the same parable later on. How is the kingdom like leaven? We might say uh, one form of leaven might be yeast. Now, one might look at the parable without explanation from Jesus. And he might give different explanations. However, what is the way stressed in the passage of the parable? What is, what is emphasized in this parable? What is the moral of the story, you might say? What, what main point is stressed in this parable of the kingdom of heaven being like leaven? He goes on, he says, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. In the parable, Jesus told of a woman who took and hid leaven or yeast and three measures of meal or flour. Eventually, all the meal was leavened. The yeast permeated every part of the dough. This passage of the parable where he describes the three measures of meal reminds me of Abraham and his hospitality in Genesis 18. Remember how Abraham told Sarah to prepare for their guests, their three guests with three measures of meal? Genesis 18, 6. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah and said quickly, Make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, 
and make cakes. He wanted to give them a morsel of food to eat so that they may be refreshed. He was a very hospitable man. Love of strangers. Anyway, in the parable, Jesus told of a woman who took and hid in three measures of meal leaven till it was all leavened. Like leaven, what could Jesus mean? Jesus gave the parable again without explanation. The main point of the parable, I think, is found at the end, giving the result. He said, till it was all leavened. Leaven is pervasive. With time, yeast spreads through every part of the dough. Leaven is pervasive. In the parable, leaven is a figure for influence. While in other passages, leaven has a negative connotation. Here, the meaning in relation to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is positive. Think of the benevolent influence of Christ of the kingdom of Christ. In the books of the New Testament, leaven often has a metaphorical meaning. Later in Matthew's account, Jesus used leaven in a negative way. In Matthew 16, 5 to 12, Jesus warned his disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In verse 6, Jesus points out that it was not the literal leaven of bread, but the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees in verse 12. And so while uh, leaven can soon spread throughout the whole lump of dough, throughout all the wheat, the meal, so the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees could spread, too, in a, in a negative way. Certainly, one form of influence is in teaching. In the New Testament, in Paul's epistles, Paul wrote concerning the pervasiveness of leaven, saying twice, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Paul said. 1 Corinthians 5, 6, Galatians 5, 9. In the letter to the Corinthians, he taught them to live the Christian life with sincerity and truth, not with malice and wickedness. And so in the passage, 1 Corinthians 5, he taught them to, to live the Christian life. Not with, not with the leaven of malice and wickedness, leaven of sin, but the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. In the letter to the Galatians, he warned against the spreading of false doctrine. Galatians 5, 9. Again, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. So we see the influence in a negative way of of corrupt teaching. Of course, teaching can also have positive influence. The teaching of Christ certainly is positive and benevolent. How has the doctrine of Christ, as taught and lived by his faithful disciples, benevolently influenced the world? Think of the world in the time of Paul. Think about the world in which was present when Paul preached the gospel of the kingdom. In Romans chapter 1, in 18, Paul had just said that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation that for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek in Romans 1 and 16. And that 
the just shall live by faith. But then in the rest of the chapter, in verses 18 to 32, he describes God's wrath on unrighteousness. He said in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who suppress the truth in an unrighteousness. He goes on to describe the world, the Gentile world in which he lived. In passages like verse 23, how they changed the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Idolatry. Verse 24, God gave them up to uncleanness, the lust of their hearts, the dishonor of their bodies. To exchange the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than creator. Who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. And as you read through the rest of the chapter, he describes various sins. These are the characteristics of some of the people in the world in which he lived. But we see with the teaching of the gospel and with people hearing the doctrine of Christ, the lives of many were changed. Paul's life himself was changed. A man who once persecuted the church, and now he's preaching as an apostle of Christ. He was ready to preach. He was not ashamed to preach. He felt himself a debtor to preach. The gospel had saved him and could save others, too. And if Paul could be saved, guess what? Anyone could be saved. Read the unparalleled passage of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. What other teachings compare? Are there any teachings outside the scriptures to compare with the teachings of, of Jesus? Read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in your, in your time. For example, Matthew 7 and 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. Here we see Jesus teaching what we sometimes call the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done to you. Think how the world would be changed just by that one teaching if people would apply it in their lives, treating people the way that they themselves would want to be treated. The kingdom of Christ is one of truth and justice, righteousness and holiness, mercy and grace, forgiveness and hope. Jesus teaches us to love and to be faithful, to be kind and to be good. I look back at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes of Christ. And then after the Beatitudes, he says in verses 13 to 14, to verse 16, these figures for his disciples of how they would influence the world for good. He said in verse 13 of Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus taught these wonderful teachings. As we read here in the scriptures, the kingdom of Christ was so different from many kingdoms, the other kingdoms of the world. His kingdom was one of truth and justice. His kingdom of righteousness and holiness. His kingdom, one of mercy and grace. His kingdom of forgiveness and hope. Think of the hope that we have through Christ, the forgiveness of our sins through his sacrifice. Think of the mercy and grace of God that we learn from to treat others with mercy and grace, righteousness and holiness to do our best, to do what is right and to abstain from what is wrong. 
and the truth that we know of God's word and fairness of, of him and his rule. The question that remains for you today, will you follow Christ? Jesus did teach us to love. He taught us many other things that are good and beneficial. And not just in this world, but eternally in life to come. Will you follow Christ? First, do you believe the gospel? In Mark 16, 15 to 16, Jesus said to his disciples, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. Do you believe the gospel? The good news? Christ? Jesus died for your sins. He died for our sins. The Redeemer offering his own life, his own blood as the ransom to set us free. Do you believe the gospel? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? The Messiah, the anointed of God? Repent. Turn from your sin. Change your heart. Turn from your sin. Confess your faith in him. As the Ethiopian did in Acts chapter 8, I believe. Jesus is the Christ, the Son, the living God. He believed. And we see that the evangelist baptized him in the water that day. He went up, went on his way rejoicing. Why? Could it be for the forgiveness of his sins? Is that the reason? Acts 2.38, Peter told the Jews on Pentecost to repent and be baptized for remission of their sins. And in Acts chapter 8, this man, he confessed his faith in Jesus and was baptized for remission of his sins. Having heard through prophecy of Isaiah and the teaching of the evangelist, Jesus. And evidently, baptism was included in that teaching of Christ. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized for remission of your sins. Are you a Christian, but you've been unfaithful? Turn from your sins in repentance and Turn back to God in prayer. He will forgive. We hope you will. Turn back to God today. If you are faithful, we encourage you to continue to be faithful. And to remember the hope that we have as Christians of heaven. And also the blessings in Christ, such as the remission of sins here today. Will you come? Thank you.